so, so many voices tonight. <laughs> if you're joining us for uh, for worship, please make your way forward and um, stand with us. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for waking us up today. Uh, thank you for giving us breath and life and purpose. I uh, pray that as we gather as your sons and daughters here in this space, um, Lord, we, we know there's nothing good in us of ourselves. Uh, there's nothing that we can do um, that will make you love us more than you love us. And so we come in in confidence, not in our own strength, not in our own ability, uh, but by your Holy Spirit and by the love and blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that as we do that, as we call upon the name of Jesus, as we call upon your son and usher your kingdom into our hearts and lives, that you would move uh, mightily and powerfully in us today. Uh, may you be glorified in this space. We pray in your name. Amen.
peace in our lives, and we're here to surrender ourselves, our kingdoms, our relationships, our brokenness, our sin, because there's only one hope, and that's in Jesus. So I want to give us an opportunity to call out and cry out to him in a way that honors him, in a way that he finds joy. He wants to release his power. He wants to release his forgiveness. He wants to release us from the bondage of sin. So let's do that together.
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase. I only trust in Jesus' name. My hope. righteousness alone for this stand before you shall come when he shall come with trumpet sound oh may I in his righteousness alone for this stand before the throne for this stand before the throne for this stand before
it's all about you, it's not about us. We're so thankful, God, that you do not yield to us. You do not change to what we want. You are who you are. And we're so grateful that you are the perfect, loving God that you are. Thank you, God, for not changing. Thank you, God, for not giving in uh, to us or to this world, but making a way for us to be more like you. Lord, we come here broken. We come here battered. We come here sinful. We come here in our imperfection. And yet as we lay ourselves down at the altar this, this morning, in turn, the blood of Jesus purifies us and perfects us. It is not in our strength. It is not in our will or determination, but it is by the power of the cross that we have been redeemed. And in that, we're so grateful, God. And I pray that we would hold on to that truth. There's nothing that we can do that will ever surprise you. There's nothing that we can do that can separate us from your love. As long as we come to you and turn to you. And that's what we do this morning. Lord, come speak to us. Lord, empower us. Lord, remind us, Lord, of the gospel. It's the only way. There's no other way. Science, politics, there's no other way. It's, it's, it's just Jesus. These things cannot restore us back to you. So I pray that as we turn to your word, Holy Spirit, give us engaging ears, engaging hearts and ears to receive your word and your truth. Even as you convict us, even as you rebuke us, even as you remind us of our wayward ways, Lord, I pray that that would not be an excuse for us to continue to turn from you mercy and your kindness that we would turn towards you because we need to experience your power we need to show this world your power not our power so that's what we do as a church as your people we come to you less than you we need the space in our day to do what you want to do pray for pastor frank empower him anoint him lord may there be no doubt that it's you speaking not him respond accordingly and properly as Saul did when you met him and you changed and transformed his life. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to show our family, our friends. That's what we want this world to see, this dying world, and you just so desperately. So we come to you and we give you the space to do, to do what you want. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, please take a moment and greet a few members next to you. Good morning, new community. Um, hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. Um, we had a pretty busy one on Thursday. We hosted my family for lunch, and then we hosted 22 people from church in the evening. Why my wife planned it that way, I don't know, but I just follow on Thanksgiving. I usually lead, but I follow on Thanksgiving. So. But in any case, I hope you guys uh, had a great Thanksgiving. I'm so glad uh, for many of you that were able to come. Uh, Thursday evening. I hope it was a good time of fellowship, obviously good food, um, all the different things that people brought. We're, we're just so grateful and so thankful that we could spend time together, um, not only just getting like full on food, uh, but also just our hearts and just joining our, our hearts together and being encouraged together. So we're starting a new sermon series today in the book of Galatians. So let me pray for us and then we're going to get right into the word. Let's, let's pray. Um, Father, as we look outside, we see the snow falling. And we thank you, just as the snow falls, that's white as snow, we thank you that the blood of Jesus covers us and makes us white as snow. And we thank you that, God, as we go into this new sermon series in the book of Galatians, there are so many things you want to challenge us with and teach us, especially in regards to the gospel. Um, we live in a world where the gospel has been manipulated, it's been compromised, um, and even in churches, been dismissed altogether. Uh, but Lord, we come today and we look at your word and we see the urgency of your word and what, you, what Paul is trying to teach Galatia in regards to staying grounded and rooted in the gospel. And we want to be that type of people. We want to be that type of church. God, this remains true to the word, true to the gospel, true to the work of Jesus. And so God, as we come today, we want to come back to that. 
because we know there are so many competing voices in this world, so many competing voices even in church, but we pray that we would hear from you in your word today and that your word would show us that Jesus is more than enough for us. So I pray that we would find our joy, our freedom, our contentment in Jesus today. So lead us to your word, challenge us by your word, transform us by, by your word, we pray. All these things in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, like I mentioned, we're starting a new series in the book of Galatians called The Gospel According to Jesus Christ. And it's a letter that Apostle Paul wrote to address the false teaching of Judaizers that was undermining Christian doctrine of justification by faith. Okay, who were the Judaizers? Judaizers were early converts who tried to force Gentile believers to adopt Jewish Mosaic customs as a condition of salvation. That unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. And Apostle Paul insists that only one thing is necessary for salvation. It's faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That the believer is justified by faith alone. And so Paul here is urging the Galatians to remember that their freedom from the law is through Christ alone. It was a warning to these churches of the consequences of abandoning the foundation of faith. You don't want to add to it. You don't want to take away from it. You're saved only through the gospel, the good news according to Jesus, which brings us to the opening of Paul's letter. This is Galatians chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Paul, he says, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters who are with me to the churches in Galatia. Okay, uh, Galatia is the collection of churches that Paul first planted in southern Asia Minor. Okay, it's current day uh, Turkey. Okay. Grace and peace to you, he says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so as Paul opens the letter, it's a typical letter, right? Shares his name, names his recipients, and he wishes grace and peace for them. But then immediately begins addressing the reason for writing this letter. Look at verse 6. He's like, I'm astonished. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and now are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to do what? Pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. And as we've already said, now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Now am I trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? Because if I were trying to please people... I would then not be a servant of Christ. And so as Paul challenges the Galatian church to protect the gospel, to protect the good news, to remind them that justification by faith is in Christ alone, we're going to answer three questions this morning that helps us protect the gospel of Jesus Christ. Three questions that help us protect the gospel, guard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the first question. What enables us to protect the gospel? Well, we have to define what the gospel is. And this is what New, Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Dictionary says about what the gospel is. It says this, the joyous good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated as gospel means a reward for bringing good news, or simply good news. The gospel is not a new plan of salvation. It is the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation that was begun in Israel, was completed in Jesus Christ. It's very important of what the gospel is. It was completed in Jesus Christ, and this is important too, and is made known by the church, right? The key to the gospel is that it's not a new plan, but a continuation of God's plan that started in the Old Testament, that was completed through Jesus. And now we, the church, have the responsibility to share that same gospel, that same good news. What's the good news? Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose on the third day. It's good news because sinners like you and me, we can be forgiven and we can go to heaven and our relationship with God is restored. Jesus completed the work. 
and it's the most important news that people need to hear. And so we have to protect it. We have to guard it. We have to be willing to die for it, like Paul did. And so what enables us to protect the gospel, we're asking? First thing is this. You have to believe in the gospel. You have to have belief in the gospel. Because you will not protect something, you will not protect someone you do not believe in. Right? You have to believe, Paul says, in the resurrection. Look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. And he he's, makes sure he points this out. Who raised Jesus from the dead. And all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you. See, while Paul was not an original disciple who witnessed the actual resurrection, he actually encountered the risen Jesus. Do you remember what it says in Acts chapter 9, verse 1? This is what it says. This is um, Paul's account of encountering resurrected Jesus. Meanwhile, Saul, right, this is Paul's name before his conversion, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, right, to the gospel of Jesus, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. See, Jesus spoke clearly and convincingly to Paul. And this encounter with the resurrected Jesus changed the trajectory of Paul's life, and he was never the same again. The gospel took hold of his heart, and he believed. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. So at once, Paul, he began to preach in the synagogues. What did he preach? That Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? Yeah, he is. And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yeah, not anymore. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus. Because he's proving that Jesus is the Messiah. It's amazing. Paul believed. And he's not going to allow any other message, any other gospel, other than the one that transformed his life to be taught and to be preached. Because Paul planted these churches during his first missionary journey. These were the first churches he ever planted. And so he has deep love, deep concern for them. He wants to make sure that they don't stray from the original gospel message. And so he confronts them. And he says, stop. Stop following the Judaizers. Stop following these legalistic teachers. Stop listening to the voices of the world who are mixing Old Testament, Mosaic law. No, protect the gospel of grace. You have to believe. You have to believe in the grace and peace that only comes from Jesus. Right? Verse 3. Grace and peace to you. From who? From who? God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. To do what? To rescue us. To deliver us, the ESV says, from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, while the Judaizers were perverting, distorting the gospel message, Paul clearly states the gospel message that he believes and he trusts. It's the grace. It's the charis in Greek, right? The favor that comes from the Father. It's the peace, the arene, the deliverance from trouble that comes from Jesus. And you see Paul's like conviction and how his conviction um, centers the gospel on God the Father who gave us his son. How the gospel centers on the person of Jesus. How the gospel centers on Jesus who paid the ransom of sin by dying on the cross. And how the gospel centers on the completed work of Jesus who rescued and he continues to rescue sinners once and for all. And while Paul makes the gospel about God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Judaizers were making it all about themselves. They were leading Christians away from grace, away from peace, towards legalism, towards back the law. From freedom, back to bondage. And the only thing Paul cared about was the gospel. The gospel that changed him. The gospel that transformed him. The gospel he believed in. 
And yeah, the Judaizers, they're like busy. They're like winning people over. They're inflating co- like their stats. They're recruiting converts. They're seeking to build their own name. But Paul here is trying to do one thing, honor and glorify God. Do one thing, save as many people as he could through the gospel. Right? Paul doesn't care about his own name. Paul does not care about his own reputation. Paul does not care if people like him or not. Because his life has been changed by the gospel. And Paul wants to see many saved by that same message. Right? And I think some of us who've been in church, in faith for a long time, you have to come back to that place again. You have to stop complicating things in your life. You have to stop, like, looking into the motivations of your heart. You have to stop making excuses. And you come back to that place of simple faith, just like Paul did when he encountered the resurrected Jesus. And so this is Paul's argument. Believe in the resurrection. Believe in the grace and peace that comes from Jesus. Because then that is what you will protect. Because if you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't believe in the grace, you don't believe in the peace, then what are you protecting? Right? What do you really believe in? What are you living for? Okay, so we're asking the question, what enables us to protect the gospel first is we have to believe it. Believe in the gospel. Not only that, we have to do this. We have to defend the gospel, right? Defense of the gospel. Because you're not going to protect something. You're not going to protect someone you're unwilling to defend, right? Paul was not going to just stand around and do nothing. The gospel changed and transformed his life. And because this gospel is being attacked, he could not stay silent. Right? So you have to defend the gospel. So Paul says in verse 6, I'm astonished. Right? He says, I'm surprised that you are so quickly deserting. You're abandoning the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. And now you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. God had called the Galatians to live in the grace of Christ, in the true gospel. But what were they doing? They were regressing back into the law. And in turning to a different gospel, they are now bound again to their sins. And Paul's surprised how quickly they were at abandoning the gospel that had saved them from their sins. Verse 7, evidently, he says, some people, right, these Judaizers, are throwing you into confusion, right, into distress. And they're trying to pervert, to distort the gospel of Christ. Judaizers were claiming to be preaching the gospel, yet it was throwing people into complete confusion because their gospel was centered on works. It was on circumcision, while the true gospel was centered on what? On grace. God had called the Galatians out of the darkness into the light, and whether they knew it or not, they're digressing back into the darkness as they are listening to this compromised gospel. And so Paul is so disturbed that the word is translated to pervert, okay? To ver- pervert means to turn about, to change into an opposite character, to reverse from what was holy to unholy, right? Perversion of any kind takes what is good, what is holy, what is right as defined by God, and it makes it impure, and it makes it unholy. And this perversion, this distortion of the gospel destroys the good news of grace, Right? The Galatians were deserting God's grace. They were perverting God's grace. They were reverting back to living by the flesh and in their own strength. The later Paul would say in Galatians 3.1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish, he says it again, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Right? What had begun in the power of the Spirit, the conviction of the Spirit that had come through the gospel, they are now trying to continue in the power of the flesh, and they are rejecting the gospel. They are rejecting grace. Guys, we do this too. We're just like the Galatians. What clearly starts with the conviction in the power of the Holy Spirit, we quickly find ourselves in a daze. We are confused. Then in our flesh, we're like trying really hard to be good and work hard for God. No, because if you don't defend the true gospel and you and allow the Spirit to continue what he started, you know what's going to happen? We're going to come under God's judgment. Look at verse 8. 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel, other than the one we preach to you, he says it the first time, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, he's saying it again, let them be under God's curse. The Judaizers had substituted the gospel of grace with a false gospel of the law. To take a message of grace than to add to it. It's sin. And so Paul's fired up. He's coming to the defense of the gospel that twice he says, let those who preach a different gospel be under what? God's curse. The Greek word is anathema, which means dedicated to destruction. Paul is saying that those who preach any other message in the gospel of Jesus Christ is dedicated to the destruction of the church, dedicated to the destruction of the gospel. Because if you believe or teach or defend anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you come under God's judgment. Right? So you have to defend the gospel, not your reputation, not your name. You have to defend God's reputation and his name. Right? Look at verse 10. Paul says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? Like, am I trying to make people happy? Or trying to make God happy? Or am I trying to please people? No, no, no. You have to not please people or else you would not be a servant of Christ. See, Paul calls the Judaizers out because instead of seeking their approval from God, instead of them trying to please God, trying to make God happy, they were seeking the praises of men. Right? They cared more about what people thought about them. Yet Paul knew that he was called and sent by God. He was a servant. He was a slave for Christ. And we know from what we've studied about Paul, all throughout Acts, he, acts, he does not care what, we, what people thought about him. He does not care. So for Paul, it's like easy for him to identify those who are preaching a false gospel. And so we should be warned as well that if you don't defend the true gospel, the one and only gospel that came through Jesus, you come under God's judgment. You come under God's curse because you are no longer representing Christ. And if you're not representing Christ, then what good news are you defending? Okay? So we're asking the question, what enables us to protect the gospel? First, you have to believe it. Second, you have to defend it. Okay? Which brings us to the second question. Why? Why must we protect the gospel? Right? Why does trusting and defending the gospel help us to guard it, to protect it? Right? Why was so like why was Paul so like passionate about the gospel. Well, before we answer this question, I think we have to identify modern-day Judaizers, who they are in our time today, right? Because the test of a person's ministry is not popularity. It's not all the miraculous and wonderful things they've done to help people. The test of a person's ministry is not the number of people they have influenced. You know why? Because we've seen it in our time. Over the last several years, many popular church leaders fall from faith. Because we've learned that the prosperity gospel taught by televangelists were frauds. Big buildings don't mean that your congregants are maturing and growing in faith. And you can even say those church leaders are not growing in faith. And just because you have a large social media following where there's no standard of truth, where everyone has an opinion, where everyone is right, have led many people astray. Right? Guys, the test of a person's ministry is not measured by their outward accomplishments and influence. But guys, it's their character. It's their integrity. It's their faithfulness to the gospel. Especially, especially when no one is looking. And so we're asking the question, why must we protect the gospel? Here's the first reason. Because when we don't protect the gospel, we're going to fall from faith. Okay? Not only will we personally be led away from faith, but we're going to lead others away from faith, right? So we have to believe in the name of Jesus, not our own name. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. So we know that Paul was not one of the original disciples. And so you know what the Judaizers are trying to do? They're trying to discredit Paul's message and his ministry. Yet here, Paul is quick to point out that he is not the one who has defined his apostleship. That he is not the one who's commissioned himself. Paul clearly states that he was called and sent by God. You know, a few weeks ago, um, I shared about how I grew up in church my whole life. 
that after my during that during my freshman year of high school, 31 years ago, I made the dis- don't do the math, okay? I made the decision to give my life to Jesus. Someone was doing the math last time. Okay. I remember how vivid and clear the diagram of the chasm between God and man was. And I think we have a picture of it. Or not. Okay. There it is. Okay. It didn't look this nice when they were drawing it on a whiteboard. But this was very vivid and clear to me. And this helped me understand Romans 3.23, the wages of sin is death. I'm on one side. You and I are on one side, right? And then um, John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his one only son, that the only way we can get across that chasm is the bridge of the cross, okay? We have to believe in Jesus Christ. We have to believe in the cross. Eric doesn't know it, but he was there when this happened. (laughs) Eric doesn't know it, but that's what happened. And Eric is one of the few people that's left, that's still walking in faith with me, right? Because even today, I look back, there are not many walking in faith today that were walking at one time with us. Why? Well, they've compromised the gospel. The gospel is no longer a priority. The gospel no longer is the foundation to their lives. They've decided to build their lives on their careers, on their families, on their children, on their money, on the American dream. And they have forgotten. No, you have been called out by God. He has purchased your sin. And God is calling you now into the world to make this gospel, this hope, this freedom known. Yet here we are, even as us, like walking years after years with the Lord. We are all trying to like manipulate grace. Trying to manufacture peace through our idols, through the money, through the children, through our families, through our careers. That brings absolutely no grace. That brings absolutely no peace at all. Right? So we have to continue to defend the gospel just like Paul did. Look at verse 6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. And are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. I read this, and I'm like, wow, Paul is writing to us that when the going gets tough, you know what we do? We quickly abandon our loyalty to Christ. We desert God. We abandon the gospel. We put our faith in a completely different gospel, in a completely different truth, which is not good news at all, which is not the gospel as Jesus intended. And so we end up back practicing a different gospel. It's, we put it into self-help. We try to buy more things to make us happy. Right? We're two-faced. And this gospel, this false gospel, leaves us completely confused and perplexed and troubled. Because there's so many voices, now we don't even know who to listen to anymore. And so, guys, everything we do and think has to be tested against the standard that has been set by the gospel, set by God's word, okay? That's why, like, progressive movements like Occupy Wall Street, Me Too, Black Lives Matter, vying to create a fairer America, they have all quickly faded because we don't hear about these movements anymore. Why did these movements fail, right? They made subjective decisions with moving goalposts geared towards attacking the elites of society, right? Like the 1%. Hollywood, academic institutions, the media. And they were more concerned about making noise than trying to actually pass laws that would actually change and impact people's lives. And so even as a church, when all of these social movements are like rising up in our culture, we continue to remain grounded in the gospel. The gospel's not going anywhere. It has not gone anywhere. And we believe the gospel is the answer that the church provides. And so like Paul, you know, I get upset that at times the gospel is being perverted and is bringing about confusion. That for some reason we think that's gospel plus circumcision. That it's the gospel plus something else. And it's infiltrated our churches. And so we have to defend the purity of the gospel. Because guys, it's the gospel plus nothing else. Justification by faith. In Christ alone. Verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under 
God's curse, anathema, a dedication to destruction. God's curse, God's judgment. If we're committed to any other message, any other solution other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are dedicated to destruction. Destruction in our own lives, in our church, even in the lives of others. Because anything, anything outside of the gospel is a lie. And so if we don't live within the confines of the gospel, Christ crucified, we're going to fall away from faith. We're going to lead others away from faith. And what happens? We come under God's curse, under his judgment. And I think this is where we can learn a lot from our last sermon series. Remember Gehazi? Uh, Lois talked about him last week, Elisha's servant. Gehazi, he witnessed all of these things. He witnessed Elisha do all of these miracles, the power of God come out, and yet he still chose to willfully sin. And he was unwilling to repent of his greed and covetousness of money. Yet we have the opportunity in our brokenness to humbly come before God to admit and confess our sin. Right? Because through the gospel, Jesus has made a way. Right? God's plan of salvation is complete. Repentance, restoration is available. But here's the problem. We're prideful. You're prideful. I'm prideful. And we choose to be dishonest with ourselves just like Gehazi. And some of you, as you come to church today, you're suffocating in your disappointments. Some of you are feeling so trapped in your failures. Some of you feel so shameful of your sin. I don't know what you're hiding because we can't hide from God. I don't know what we're trying to hide from one another. Yeah, we're, we're surprised, but God already knows. Guys, nothing surprises him. Because when we don't protect the gospel, we're going to be dragged away from it. And we will begin to believe the voices we hear in our heads. And we begin to be influenced by the world and led to judgment and to death. Okay? And so we're asking why must we protect the gospel is the first reason. Because when we don't protect the gospel, we will fall from faith. And you're like, that's such bad news. It is absolutely bad news. But here's the good news. When we protect the gospel, we will grow in faith. Guys, when the gospel is properly taught, properly applied, as God intended, we're changed. We're transformed. Others around you are transformed. And we're never the same again. Because before Paul became the Paul we know in New Testament, he was a famous Old Testament rabbi. Paul received training in the Old Testament scriptures, in the Mosaic traditions. And he was one of Judaism's like rising stars that Paul talks about himself in this way in Philippians 3.5. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I was persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. This is who he was before he encountered the resurrected Jesus. Yet on his way to Damascus, he was actually going there to persecute Christians. He was confronted by the risen and glorified Christ. That this is how he responds in Philippians 3, 7. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage. I consider them dung. That's what it literally means. Feces that I may gain Christ. The world is nothing to me because I have gained Christ. And so we have to believe. Believe in the grace and peace that we've experienced when we first responded to the gospel, right? Verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. That's the gospel, to rescue us from the present evil age. We must never forget. That our relationship with God begins in the grace of Jesus. It begins in the peace of Jesus. Yes, at that time of justification, when we made a decision to say, Lord, I'm going to follow after you. We're justified by faith alone. And now that we've been rescued from sin, now our journey of faith does not stop there. No, it has to continue. How? Through what means? Through sanctification. 
right? That's why even in Philippians 3, Paul goes on. He continues to say this. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Now, like, taken hold of what? Taken hold of the righteousness of Christ. He has not fully spiritually matured. But one thing I do, he says, forgetting what is behind and straightening toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Yes, we are justified by faith. But in sanctification, this is why we talk about discipleship all the time in our church. This is why discipleship is so important. We put forth our effort in conjunction with the power of the Spirit, in the truth of God's word, with the help of God's community to live out our salvation for today. Right? So we have to defend the message that's justified us. But we have to remember the message that's continuing to transform us. Right? Verse 6. I'm astonished, Paul says, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. See, the idea here of quickly deserting shows that the Galatians were actually in the process of abandoning the grace of Jesus. They were not fully turned away, just partially turned away. And Paul is telling them, hey, you still have a chance. You still have a chance now to turn around. And yes, you're troubled, you are confused, and at times we lose sight of the gospel. But, hey, grace is available now. Guys, you and I have the opportunity to turn back to Jesus now. It's not too late. And that's what Paul is telling the Galatians. That's what Paul is telling us. It's not too late. The gospel is available for you. There is hope. Because you've been justified by grace. What started in grace must continue in the gospel of grace, right? So like Paul, I don't want to exalt my own name, but I want to see God's grace working in me. Like Paul, I want others to say, hey, I don't see you. I see the grace of God in you. And I hope that's what you want for yourself. Verse 10, because am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? Because if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And guys, we already know Paul did not care about what people thought. He was not a people pleaser. He wasn't trying to make people happy, seek their approval. Because when Paul says, am I trying to please people? He is literally saying, I'm not trying to make these people feel good. And all of us here today, sit in this room, we are all ministers of the gospel. And our responsibility is not to seek the praises of people, but seek the approval of one, of God. And when the voices of culture, they're pressuring you, pressuring the church, when Satan is whispering lies into your ears, our responsibility is not to make people happy or to make ourselves feel better. No, we hold on and we cling to the gospel of grace, right? Like Paul, we persevere in the midst of adversity from the attacks of our enemies, to trust and defend the gospel that saved us. I said I wouldn't talk about it, but I have to talk about the Bears. I, I said I wouldn't do it. I, I did it at nine. I'm sorry, I have to say it, because there's a point. They had a 98.8% .8 chance of winning the game with four minutes left last week. And just when we thought the Bears were on the verge of winning that game, against the best team in the division, in the most improbable, impossible, historically bad way, they lost 31 to 28. I think that was the score. And I'm just hoping, like, I believe, I believe that they're going to turn it around. But, you know, like, I can keep trying to defend this team, but really, where is that going to get me? Even though I keep hoping, man, I really cannot trust them. Even in the middle of a bad season, we were like, there's this glimmer of hope. That was just like snatched away. And we're left like disappointed. We're left devastated as a Bears fan. And I share that because there is one thing we can count on. It's the gospel. I mean, it sounds silly. It's like a silly illustration example. But one thing we can count on, the gospel. That's sinners like you and me, can be forgiven of our sin and our relationship with God restored. And I said this at nine, I'll say it again. Like, I love the Bears, but you know, the gospel is more important 
than whether or not the Bears will win another Super Bowl. It doesn't matter because the gospel has not failed us. We remain grounded and rooted in the grace of Jesus. And when we are committed to continually protecting it like Paul, gospel transforms us to continue to grow in faith. And we are able to actually help others to faith, right? Because if the church is like the world, then why are we here? Why do you worship this morning? If we are not any different than the world, then there's nothing distinct. There's nothing different about us. Because as soon as we abandon grace, as soon as we desert the gospel, we depend on our own power, our own ideas, our own genius, our own willpower. Yeah, it might last for a moment, like these progressive or cultural social movements, but inevitably you're going to be led away from faith. Okay, so we're asking the question why. Why must we protect the gospel? Here's the bad news. Because when we don't protect the gospel, we're going to fall from faith. But here's the good news. But when we do protect it, we're going to grow in faith. Okay? Leads us to the last question. How? How do we protect the gospel? Right? How do we protect the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can persevere in faith? Here's the first way. By understanding our call to believe and defend the gospel. Okay? God has called us. Each and every one of us who believes in the gospel, out of the darkness and into the light, God has called us now to represent him in this dark world. And so you have to believe in the gospel, right? Verse 1, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. We have been called by God, not by men, not by people, to trust in the resurrection. We have been called by God, not by men, to believe and protect the gospel. Of Jesus Christ. And so we have to defend it, right? Verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? Because if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Guys, we've been called by God to build his name. Not to build our name. Not to build our own kingdoms. God has graciously opened our eyes to see him. And that we have the privilege to make Jesus known somehow through broken people like us. We've been called by God to be servants for him. Okay, and the second way is this. We have to realize that we've been justified by faith in Christ alone, right? This is the gospel message that we must protect, Ephesians 2.8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, right? So it all starts and all ends with the grace that we find in Jesus. Verse 3, grace and peace to you. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Right? According to the plan of the Father, grace and peace came through Jesus. And we are now justified by faith in Christ alone. Jesus is the one who has rescued us. Jesus is the one who has redeemed us once and for all from our sin. So it is not Jesus plus something else that saves us. It is not Jesus plus my works. It's Jesus alone. Jesus alone. The only thing we contribute to our salvation is our sin. And so stop running from God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for you. Stop hiding. Bring your shame. Bring your sin. Bring your shortcut. Bring it all to the Lord. You've been justified by faith in Christ alone. Right? That's why Paul says in Romans 5, verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith. Into what? Into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in what? In the hope. Hope of the glory of God. The gospel is our peace. The gospel is our grace. The gospel is our hope. This is what we are protecting. This is what allows us to grow in faith. We have been justified by faith in Christ alone. Okay, and then one last way. We have to prioritize our relationship with Jesus. Guys, you have to spend time in the word to get to know Jesus. I mean, it's like kind of obvious. You have to spend time in prayer, communing with Jesus. You have to talk to him. And you have to allow him to talk to you. Right? Verse 6, or else this happens. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. 
And so you have to spend time in the word, spend time in prayer, remain grounded in the gospel so that you are not what? Thrown into confusion. Remain in the gospel so you won't believe in a perverted or compromised gospel. Right? Verse 9, as we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So if you don't know Jesus, you're not going to remain pure and blameless. But if you know Jesus, if you remain grounded in the gospel, you're not going to come under God's curse. You're not going to fall under God's judgment when we face him one day. You know, like reading all this and even like, we, you know, we do all these sermon series in like the book of Acts and we're reading about Paul. And you're like, part of me like is asking the question, Paul, why are you making such a big deal about protecting the gospel? Why are you making such a big deal about persevering in the gospel? Do you know why? Because it's literally a matter of life and death. It's literally a matter of life and death. So we have to protect it. We have to persevere in it. Because at the end of the day, you can't blame God. He has made a way through his son, his one and only son. And you can only blame yourself if you're unwilling to trust in the gospel. Okay? So we're asking the question, how? How do we protect the gospel? Okay? First, by understanding our call to believe and defend the gospel. Second, by realizing that we are justified by faith in Christ alone. Third, by prioritizing our relationship with Jesus. I'll just share one last illustration as we finish up. You know, at our last board meeting, church board meeting, we were discussing church matters. And um, we are talking, and an elder DC, like, we are talking, he asked with an impassioned plea. He said, why did you say that? Because now, you th- now it sounded like I was yelling in the meeting. I'm like, you're not yelling. It was an impassioned plea. This is what he was asking. What's our objective? What's our objective? Like, he, I don't know how many times he said it. What's our objective? And, we're, you know, we're going through the meeting. We're, like, discussing. And then he just keeps asking this question. And I'm not sure if we actually reached a, like a, we reached a conclusion there and answered his question. I don't think we did. But here's the answer. I realized as I was, you know, preparing this week. Is to, what's, our, what's our objective as a church? It's to do our best to help people to understand the gospel according to Jesus Christ. And if our church ever becomes anything other than the gospel, then we've failed. Right? For those of us here who believe in the gospel, the good news May we continue to believe and continue to grow in our faith. And I pray that as we grow in faith, we're going to confidently defend it. We're going to confidently teach the gospel so that we can help others come to faith. And that's my prayer for us, that we would be known as a church that is uncompromising, unapologetic about the God we worship, the God we serve, the God we live for. For Jesus has died for us, and now we have life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you so love the world, that you gave us your one and only son, that whoever believes in you would not die, would not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. And because of what you've done for us, help us to believe in the completed work of Jesus. It is done. It is finished. And because it is a matter of life and death, help us to defend the gospel with our lives. We do not want to be known as a generation of compromisers who could not persevere in the gospel to the end. But Lord, as we hold on to the gospel, help us to continue to grow in faith. Help us to trust in the gospel with our lives. That the world would see the hope of Jesus in broken people like us. We want Jesus to be glorified. Jesus to be seen. Jesus to be known in us. So receive all the worship. Receive all the glory, we pray. All these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll continue in silent worship as we present our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Feel free to rock, Giselle, as we brought your physical offerings brought in that basket. Let us stand and sing in response uh, to the God who has made a way for us in the gospel that makes us alive and gives us hope in the future.
pray together. God, may we never, ever, ever take granted the work of the cross, the work of Jesus Christ on that cross. Help us to never, ever take for granted that he took the sins of all humanity, past, present, and future, even our future sins, and he took it with him to that cross, and he poured out and spilled his blood for us so that we may live, so that we may have life, that we may have eternity with you. God, help us to live not in our own power, but to live in the resurrection power of Jesus, just as we sing, just as we learn in the book of Galatians. God, we want people to see, not us, but to see you. Somehow, using sinful, broken people who are humble and willing to be shaped and molded by you, God, to change and transform this world and to give them hope that this world cannot give or this world cannot offer. So embolden us to be unashamed of who we are in Christ. Embolden us, God, to let this world and this city know that we belong to you. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine down upon you. And may he pour out his favor and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good afternoon, New Community Church. Good afternoon. It's such a privilege and honor to be able to worship with you. Uh, today, if it's your first time or if you're a returning guest, we're so thankful God brought you here. Please stick around for a time of lunch and fellowship after these announcements. Next Saturday, um, December, we're already in December, last month of the year. Wow, it's crazy. Uh, we will have our D300 retreat um, tentatively at Pastor Brad's home at this moment. Uh, if you've gone through D100, 200, and you're in 300 um, large groups and small groups, um, please feel free to sign up. It's on our app, um, and we hope to see you then from 8 to 4 p.m. Uh, and then next Sunday, we'll have um, Fellowship Sunday at Woodbury Park after the service is here uh, from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Please sign up uh, just so we know how many heads will be going there so we can provide um, proper sustenance and also plan for the gym time and stuff like that. So we'll have time there from 12 to 4 p.m. next week. Sign up on the app or on your social media outlets. And then uh, December 16th, uh, that Saturday, uh, Breakthrough Annual Christmas Store is taking place. So if you're interested in serving uh, the community in East Garfield Park or even um, donating um, funds for gifts there, you can sign up on the app or talk to Pastor Frank about that. We meet on Tuesdays and Fridays here for a prayer meeting at 630. So hope to see you then. If not, then we'll see you next Sunday. Have a blessed weekend. Thank you.